Greetings. A question that often arises is why all technological disruptions are interconnected because this is one of the assertions that I make in my Atom thesis which I now have rebranded as third millennium economics. And let me explain why that is. All technological disruptions are in fact interconnected. The extent of interconnectedness varies based on how adjacent they are to each other, but all technological disruptions are interconnected. An innovation in artificial intelligence hardware versus an innovation in more efficient hydraulic fracturing to extract oil and natural gas from the ground may seem that they are unrelated. People working in one field are not necessarily tied to the people working in the other field and don't even know each other, but they are very closely related. An AI image generation service like the one that I have recently been using to make thumbnails for some of my videos is also connected to the increase in efficiency of photovoltaic panels, for example, seemingly very far apart, but all technological disruptions are interconnected to each other and all fit into a pipe that is a percentage of the economy that can be measured with some accuracy. If you look at this video up here, you will see how I estimated that about 3% of the world's economy was now high tech. As per what was true at the time of this particular video, I'm soon going to do an updated version of that video because we are now approaching 4% of the world economy that is now high tech. But this pipe of 4%, how does it accommodate all technological disruption to the extent that they all mutually reinforce each other? Well, how does a technology increase living standards and produce wealth? Through entrepreneurship, through business, through productization. What is technology other than a way to do an existing function much more cheaply and more efficiently, which thereby creates a far greater volume of that particular activity because it is cheaper and more efficient. So do you see where I'm going with this? If hydraulic fracturing made oil cheaper because in 2014 or thereabouts, U.S. hydraulic fracturing increased oil supply in the U.S. by 25, 30, 35 percent, which increased the world's oil supply by about 3%. This was all it took for the price of crude oil, West Texas Intermediate crude oil, to fall by half, which pulled down the world price of oil, Brent oil, also by almost half. A 3% increase is all that it took for that much of a price decline. That's how elastic the price of oil was. But this technological disruption reduced oil prices which improved the input costs of all types of other businesses that use oil. Some of these are low-tech businesses, such as just stocking a retail store with ordinary trucks that use diesel fuel derived from oil. But some of these are high-tech businesses as well. And therefore, the input costs of all types of businesses reduced. And among those businesses, the ones that are high-tech are always going to be the ones that saw the greatest disproportionate benefit because a technology business model is forecast out as a model of financial projections. And if that company cannot become profitable, it may not be pursued. And even if the founder wants to pursue it, they will not get venture capital investment or even sophisticated angel investor investment. But once an input cost assumption can be lowered, there is a slice of businesses that were borderline that become viable now. So if there was a certain type of business, let's say an autonomous driving fleet to deliver a certain type of product to a certain destination, if oil costs were 10% of that entire business model's input costs, but the cost of oil fell by half, then that 10% became only 5% of the total cost. And if that business model could not forecast out profitability under 10% of their cost being oil, that now becoming 5% might just have pushed that particular business out of the borderline zone and into the viability zone. I hope that makes sense. That is why it's funny that even people who should have known better made a variety of very poor financial forecasts. When IBM created the first computer in 1939, known as the ENIAC, it was as big as a room, 
and today it would be far, far, far less powerful than the electronics in some household electronics appliance that you probably just throw away when you don't need it anymore. The chairman of IBM at the time said that there would only ever be a demand for five computers in the world because he assumed that every computer would be room size like that. Even more recently, Bill Gates, someone who really should know better because for a long time he was the richest man in the world and is still in the top three or four. And Microsoft is still one of the highest market cap companies in the world. Even he said that nobody would have a demand for more than 650 kilobytes of RAM because he did not envision that when the cost got lower and lower, there are more inputs that RAM could be viable for. 640 kilobytes of RAM, he said that a long time ago. Now many desktop PCs, just middle of the line desktop PCs, have 64 gigabytes of RAM, which is to say 100,000 times as much. In fact, a little more than 100,000 times as much because it's in binary, maybe 110,000 times as much. As the cost of any input gets cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, more businesses that people could not have imagined become possible because the assumption of profit and loss changes, and that is what people have to think about. Artificial intelligence is a big factor over here. Look at this chart that I often use when I give speaking engagements. Let's say you have an idea, and that idea results in $3 million a year of revenue. And before using AI, it turns out that it takes $4 million in costs in terms of payroll, et cetera, that you have to pay to generate $3 million a year of revenue. And unfortunately, that means this business is not viable because you are generating a loss of $1 million a year. You cannot forecast a scenario under which this business will become profitable, and therefore you cannot really sell it to an investor. Certain tech companies can sell even when they're not profitable, but that is for different reasons and not what we're talking about here. But now on the right-hand side of this chart, imagine if you see a scenario where you can use artificial intelligence to hire fewer people and get more work done for fewer people on staff and therefore lower costs. So you have the exact same $3 million a year revenue stream, but now the costs to generate that revenue stream are just $2 million a year, half. And therefore this business is profitable, $1 million a year profit this business is suddenly viable because the input costs to generate that revenue stream became lower. And this happens in the economy all the time. This is how all economic progress has manifested going back centuries. It's just now that this process is much, much faster than before. And types of businesses that exist today are of a nature that people from even 40 years ago, 1984, could not have imagined as possible. There are entire professions that came into existence only recently, such as social media influencer, or AI artist, or video game animator, a whole host of professions, pretty well paying, that did not exist even 30 years ago, let alone 100 years ago. This process is extremely poorly understood, even by people who should know better. And I'm not even talking about PhD economists, but even people who work in the private sector who should know better don't understand this. I'll give another example. In 2000, it was believed that by 2020, video conferencing would be commoditized and inexpensive, and many people who do only desk jobs would be able to work from home all of the time, or at least most of the time. Yet as of 2019, this was not happening. There was too much stickiness in the office and too much judging of employees based on what time they get to the office and what time they leave. Then the pandemic occurred and look what happened. The predictions of futurists from the year 2000, such as Ray Kurzweil and George Gilder, their prediction that seemed that it was never going to happen suddenly happened and it became viable for people to work from home. And now that the COVID-19 pandemic is over, there is still 50 plus percent working from home among all office workers and in the tech industry, the industry where the vast majority of net new wealth and net new jobs are created, it is easily 65 to 70 percent working from home in terms of workday instances, which means that people go to the office once or twice every two weeks if they live nearby. If they live far away, they fly in and spend three days in the office once per month or whatever, some combination thereof. 
Many people are screaming about this because now the United States and other advanced countries have twice as much office supply than they need because office supply occupancy has fallen by 50%. This is deflationary, technological deflation. However, the input costs of businesses became lower because now a startup company, let's say they get around to funding and they have 20 people, they used to have to spend a lot of their investor money just on office rent and office maintenance when now they don't have to do that to nearly the same degree. They can maintain either a very small office or no office and redeploy those funds into more value added activities such as hiring more software engineers or more marketing people or more salespeople. This is bad for people who owned a lot of commercial real estate, but it's good for the rest of the economy because this is a huge amount of new deflation that has been released, not to mention more flexibility for tens of millions of workers being able to work from home and not to go too far on this work from home tangent, but this is an example of how technology created a disruption that lowered the input costs of a wide range of many other businesses some of which are technology businesses and then could produce more technology. So all technological disruptions are interconnected and mutually reinforcing. I do explain this in chapters two, three, and four of my Atom publication, now Third Millennium Economics. If you want to read more about that, you may wish to look at that again or see it for the first time if you've never seen it before. But I want everyone to realize how interconnected all technological disruptions are. And this is a major economics insight that is never going to arise from the economics establishment. I mean, people have won the Nobel Prize in economics for far, far less impactful insights than this. But alas, I am probably not going to get any such recognition, at least within my lifetime for that. What happens after that remains to be seen. Maybe artificial intelligence has a role in that too, in terms of determining economics insights and innovations in proportion to their actual value to uplifting the human condition. Now, if you like this type of content, I encourage you to subscribe to this channel and thank you very much for watching.